uh, when we discuss tonight's theme, which is the fifth indriya, the fifth faculty, what are often called spiritual faculties, um, or I like to think of them as capacities. We cultivate them, we work to, uh, to cultivate them so as to fill ourselves up with an ability or a skill that becomes a power, the, the balas. And so the five indriyas or the five faculties or what are sometimes called spiritual faculties um, are things that we cultivate with some effort, with some uh, sense of zeal, until they become so much a part of our imprinting as practitioners that they become powers or strengths. And that's the, name, the meaning of the word bala, is strength. They become just self-evident. We don't have to work at them. They just are uh, qualities that we are able to bring to, into our lives and that are really quite self-evident. And so we began with Shraddha, which is faith. This was five weeks ago. It's hard to believe that it's been five weeks. Um, we moved on to energy or virya, and then on to sati or mindfulness. And then uh, last week we did concentration or samadhi, which is really, if you recall, it's a collectedness of the mind. It is a gathering back together of mind, um, sort of in a sense of unity. So, and then today we here arrive at this final of the five, which is wisdom or prajna or panya in the Pali. And so um, it'll be interesting to look at what is wisdom from the Buddha standpoint. We hear this word constantly, wisdom this, wisdom that, fusing wisdom and compassion, or the goal of practice is wisdom and so on. But what, do, what are we really sort of talking about here uh, from the standpoint of cultivation and then the standpoint of capacity and ability? So we'll be we'll be looking at that after we do some practice together. Yeah. Um, these little pearls of wisdom from all kinds of experiences, not even necessarily comfortable or good experiences, what we would call good ones. But there is something there within all of them. I wasn't going to do this, and I felt initially like, okay, let's launch into the sort of the doctrine of wisdom. And I thought, ugh. Oh. <laughs> We can still do that. But I didn't want to start with, now, here is what Buddhism says all about what wisdom is and what you should believe, and, but rather, what are the insights arising from mindful practice, mindfulness practice, that give us uh, a sense of insight of what we can call sort of a little bit more penetrative awareness, penetrative insight into the nature of our experiences. And each of you, that's why I'm grateful to Andre, Jane, and Anne for, for sharing personally like this. Um, and part of it is that in uh, Buddhism, particularly in Mahayana, there are seen to be three forms of wisdom. And the first is wisdom gained by hearing, by learning, basically. So we hear a teaching, we hear a text, or we read a text, we hear a master or a teacher give a talk, um, and there is wisdom in not just what we're listening to, but how we're listening. And so, you know, the great Tsongkhapa has this uh, great analogy of how not to listen with the three vaults, faults of a vessel. Has anyone heard this before? Basically, a vessel is like a, you know, like a clay pot, yeah? And we want to listen. We don't want to listen like an overturned pot where nothing can get in. <laughs> Essentially, nothing's filtering within. So we want to be right side up so that we're fillable, yeah? The second fault of a vessel would be a cracked pot or a pot, a leaky pot so that you put water in and it just drains right out the bottom. It doesn't, it can't hold it. In other words, you can put things in, but they don't stay there very long. I mean, this is all of us, you know, we'd like to retain, you know, everything we can, but we can't always retain everything. But then there's the third pot, and that is sometimes called the poison pot or the dirty pot, where it's so full of muck 
and sort of its own content that it it's like you put the water in and it sort of makes the water dirty yeah it makes it muddy and so the point is listening right side up with no holes no leaks and a clean and with a clean interior basically <laughs> and so listening and receiving teachings really whether again whether we're reading or hearing the teachings that's the first form of wisdom when we can listen without those three faults of a vessel um wisdom is possible simply in hearing now the second form of wisdom is um uh, of wisdom is the wisdom of reflection or contemplation and that is where uh, we've taken teaching and we've internalized it to the point where there is an experience of some kind that we're having we're having a little more of a uh, what we can call a metabolizing of the teaching where it actually makes sense personally experientially and so that takes just sort of the 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 listening or the reading or the studying and now it takes it to a much deeper level for us yeah and so contemplating seeing how it relates to our lives and kind of putting it to the test if you will which is what the buddha said put all of these teachings to the test don't just take my word for it and then there is the wisdom arising from meditation and that's where we cultivate uh, our contemplative practice so that whatever teaching it is actually becomes a realization. Yeah, it becomes something that transforms us in some way. It transforms our way of being in the world, our practice, our way of seeing. Um, and so it's interesting to look at these indriya, these faculties that we're cultivating before they become powers, before they become strengths, bala, they are indriyas, they are, they are faculties that we seek to balance with each other. Uh, these five faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentrative stillness, and wisdom are all seen to be, uh, they need to be in balance with each other. Yeah, But it's really mindfulness that paves the way for wisdom to become the most profound of these five. Mindfulness is the most comprehensive. In other words, mindfulness involves all of the others, but it's wisdom that actually gives each of them um, their profundity. So faith with wisdom becomes really profound because our seeing, our capacity to realize, whether it's what we call the Dharma Datu or sort of the, the Buddha field that makes up the entirety of creation, uh, or something else shapes kind of how we are in the world, how we see ourselves, how we see others, and so on. And so as faculties, the first two wisdoms um, really stand out, right? Learning, we're putting effort into studying, into learning. Uh, we're contemplating things. Maybe we're re-watching a video or you know, what have you, but we're, we're really sort of taking things in to a much more deep level. They're not just intellectual understanding. And then it's the meditation. So third form of wisdom that actually begins to yield a sense of pen, what we can call penetrative insight or insight where we actually see things differently. We see the nature of reality as it really is and not through filters through projections, through our agendas or our desires or our aversions. But really, it is this um, fifth indriya that becomes a realization of the middle way, the middle path. And so in the reading that I gave you from the Lankavatara Sutra, the Buddha tells us that enlightenment the enlightenment that can be known is not the true enlightenment <laughs> until we actually have a direct experience of it fundamentally as non-dual. So it's not about this is it, this is not it, good, bad, pain, pleasure, but constantly seeking the middle way, seeing through the polarities, the extremes, 
beyond the, this is what penetrative insight is about, until we can kind of see what else is there. Some translations of it might call it intuitive uh, wisdom. Some call it transcendental wisdom. But however we look at it, we're really talking about seeing the nature of things. And not as fixed, permanent things, but rather, uh, as Leslie, my teacher, used to tell us, beginning to see things in the terms in terms of energy, and not in terms of actual solid, conceptual, permanent entities, but that things are really aggregates of energy and interdependence, or what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing, is a ubiquitous truth here. Uh, so this too is wisdom. Yeah. Um, now, from a classical Buddhist standpoint, uh, wisdom often will be taught to us in this way, that wisdom is understanding the nature of things through like the perfection of wisdom sutra, which says that all things are empty of inherentness. And uh, it's important to see with discerning wisdom uh, just the relative nature of things, not that they are, in fact, uh, concrete and enduring. The Four Noble Truths, seeing the Four Noble Truths clearly, knowing them to be true, experiencing them. What's called the Trilakshana, or uh, the Three Marks of Conditioned Phenomena, another doctrine within which all the Buddhist teachings exist, in that, number one, all things are impermanent. Number two, this truth causes us to suffer. And number three, the nature of all things is to be of non-self. Yeah. Or four seals in the Mahayana tradition. There's an extra one added to this. And the ultimate way to be in the world is to cultivate emptiness or shunyata. Emptiness is a poor translation, but profound openness without content. This is shunyata. So understanding the 12 links of dependent arising, that who we are arises in dependence upon the conditions that shape the, the nature of the arising itself. This is um, Pratit Samutpada. So some of you who have studied Buddhism know, uh, may know these. And we're not going to go through all of these. I mean, we could. What, what I'm saying here, though, is that wisdom in the Buddhist and classical Buddhism is really sort of part of understanding all of these different doctrines. Um, now, when we start moving into Mahayana Buddhism, we start seeing wisdom sort of shaping, taking shape within the uh, figure of the Bodhisattva. We start seeing compassion and the one who vows to stay in the world, to be reborn, to continue working for the liberation of all beings uh, and the sort of abandonment of suffering until the last blade of grass is free. And only then will the Bodhisattva take that final step into full liberation and become a non-returner in, in that sense. And what comes with that is an interesting kind of addition to some of the early texts on wisdom. And that has to do with the bodhisattva, what is the bodhisattva really cultivating? What does wisdom mean for this kind of being? And really, as I mentioned before, it's this quality of non-duality, but it's also seeing unity between myself and the one who's suffering, that there's no distinction here. And so, you know, my well-being, my liberation depends on that of the other, to some extent. And there is this sense of unity, of, of oneness, if you will, not just in the suffering, but in Buddha nature. Now, we, we don't deny the suffering, but we also don't deny the ubiquity of Buddha nature as well. And so being able to see this, to know this, and then to put our responses to suffering into a skillful response, skillful means ways that are appropriate for the person or the being or the animal or that we're with. What is the most skillful thing here? And so in a way here, the wisdom is that of non-duality, of unity, and of being a benefit in a way that is skillful and not just 
sort of random or pre-thought out or formulaic. We can't be. After all, the nature of bodhicitta or the mind of awakening is spontaneous. It's what we can call spontaneous resolve. So, um, and then the last point is Shanti Deva, the great 12th century Indian saint who wrote the Bodhisattva way of life, uh, the Bodhicharya Vitara, the great classic uh, Indian text uh, in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, who spends a large part of the last chapter of this text, the Bodhisattva way of life, talking about the perfection of wisdom and what that entails is really having a very clear sense of relative versus ultimate reality and how both of these two qualities where how they can work skillfully um, and so if you're not familiar with this apparent dichotomy what we're talking about is that in the relative sense conceptual sense the way that we are in the world the function that we play the roles that we have are all part of a relative reality or what we can call conventional reality, that we use these um, sort of worldly based ideas, concepts, images, um, identities and such for the ultimate end. But they don't define who we are uh, ultimately. But there are ways that we skillfully craft and cultivate uh, ways of being of benefit. As opposed to what we can call ultimate knowing, which is to really see the, the nature of all things as they are without the filters. In many ways, what Zen practitioners call suchness, or just a direct, clear, open, sharp uh, perception of things as they are without getting in our own way. You know? So that is another word for this penetrative wisdom. And what's required to have this experience um, again, we go back to mindfulness as the third of these indriyas. First, cultivating a sense of deep, deep calm, a sense of clarity arising naturally when the mind is still and settled, and the sense of deep tranquility that these three, what we would characterize as shamatha, yeah, as uh, calm abiding or one pointedness leading to calm abiding set the stage in which mindfulness leads to seeing purely, seeing clearly, even our own suffering. And so um, what we're doing here is really kind of allowing the practice of, um, of guarding introspection that Shantideva tells us about in this text to lead to a sense of insight or vipassana or vipassana, where we start seeing the nature of things as impermanent and, and the patterns of suffering, but also that which holds all of it in awareness with love, with a sense of genuine loving intent for well-being, for happiness, for freedom from suffering. And then through this, these insights we cultivate, wisdom arises, the fact that we uh, we begin to see how everything fits together. Um, and that we also can be okay with paradox, that things don't always have to match perfectly. We can live comfortably with the paradoxical nature of truth, if you will, as well as the multidimensionality of phenomena, that, that things and people exist, not just in the moment of our perception of them, but that they are existing in multiple dimensions at one time. So a person may appear angry, but in another sense, they, are, they can be incredibly loving as well. Um, and we basically are taking the sense of wholeness uh, that we are cultivating and also re mirroring the rest of the world and others. Does that make sense? So I was kind of, you know, I was kind of questioning a bit earlier today, like, how do we talk about wisdom in this short time we have together? Because it is, there are so many uh, doorways to enter into this conversation. Um, and so many ways, places that wisdom appears on many lists. 
and um, how it relates to suffering and realization and all of that. But that's why I wanted to, to begin with checking in with your experience in that meditation when we were when we were quiet. Because I think that's where we really learn what wisdom is more so than just the first two, right? Or listening and study, contemplation, all well and good. We need those things to really sort of prime ourselves for the realizations in meditation. Yeah. But that's where, where the wisdom really seasons itself and really can lead to that kind of seeing that is what we call the middle way or the non-dual path, not just thinking in terms of polarity. So I'm curious what you all have to say about this. Um, the, the, the last thing actually that I forgot to say was once this kind of cultivation stage of wisdom becomes something that is self-evident and actually enjoyable, and it's imbued naturally with a sense of love and compassion, it has become a bala, it has become a strength or a power. It's no longer that which we have to wrestle with and struggle with, but rather we now have a container within ourselves within which wisdom can flourish. And it may not take so much effort as it does when we're cultivating this like discerning, discerning, um, discerning mind to try to figure things out, which can really hang us up early on. Well, that is a history of the human mind. Yeah. That is, that is mind and consciousness and in this human form, everything is made up, not just religion. Our entire lives are made up. The Buddha said this in maybe not in those terms. And so what we're doing is trying to deconstruct all of this make believe this imaginal life, this dreamlike life we're living to try to uncover clarity and what I've been saying, penetrative insight, where we can see through the haze um, and just have a moment where the mind is free from all of it. And that is absolutely possible. Promise you. Well, the form points to something. This is why the the distinction between conventional reality and ultimate reality matters. This is why Shantideva was so, uh, felt so strongly about that we understand how important both are. Yeah. Without the, without the one, the conventional part, how on earth are we ever going to reach the ultimate part? And unless we're lucky, unless we're reborn and we, we're just born in, sort of open, clear awareness. But most of us are living lives where we've been conditioned. We have kind of these imprints and these tendencies, and we really need those wholesome structures that do reflect certain universal truths. It doesn't mean that uh, it wasn't made, made up is not always a bad thing because some things are made, are made from, they're given form from deep insight. You see, there's a difference there, and they're, they're skillfully laid the path for us to follow, for us to to be free. 